Bible, you're not worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. And so here, this was the case with Judah. He says their sin was written with a pen of iron and with the point of a diamond. That was etched in. Their sin was etched in. And can I tell you, you can get to a point where your sin is so etched into you that you don't and you cannot get relief from it. You don't want to. When it gets to that point, you don't want to. You don't want to deal with it. You'd rather live with it. And that's the case of what was happening with Judah. So now verse 5 says this. He says, Thus saith the Lord. The prophet is establishing these words and he's saying, It's not me that's telling you this. It's not some man that was called just to come and preach a sermon. He says, I'm establishing the very acts or the very words of Almighty God. Thus saith the Lord. If you're going to get mad at anybody, get mad at God. Don't get mad at me because I'm just the messenger. I'm just a messenger. He says, thus saith the Lord. He says, cursed be the man that trusts in man. Cursed is the man. And I want to give you the definition of that in the Hebrew. It is more specifically meant to bind with a spell. To hem in with obstacles. To render powerless to resist. You may know someone like that right now. We think of a curse as something that's, you know, a spell, like a demon cursing. But cursed be the man that trusts in man. When you put your trust in man, what you're saying is, is that the frailty of human nature is where you find your wisdom, where you find your strength. And when you put your trust in man... You're not putting your trust in God. Man is, is finite. God is infinite. Man knows in part, but God knows everything. The beginning, the middle, and the end. And so he says, if you put your trust in man, you're going to be cursed. You're going to be bound. You're going to be oppressed. There's going to be obstacles in your way. He says, and makes flesh his arm, which means your your strength. Can I tell you there are people today that have more trust and more interest in the internet and what the internet has to say rather than what God has to say. There are people in the church today, they run to psychologists first before running to God. They want to see what man has to say. They want to see how they can get the guilt relieved of what they're doing and yet still keep what they're doing but removing the guilt. Cursed be the one that puts their trust in man, makes his flesh his arm. When we do that, when we put our trust in man, when we put our trust in the flesh of the the arm of flesh, then we understand and we know from God's word that that's the beginning of your heart departing from the Lord. 
When you and I begin to trust in man in the arm of flesh, that means that our heart has already departed from God. Hmm. When we put our trust in our own lives, when we make decisions without even, not, not even asking God, God, what do you think about this? We make life-changing decisions without even including God. But God's word says to trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Why? Why not lean on your own understanding? Because your, your own understanding can become prejudiced to the things that you want versus the things that God wants. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not to your own understanding, but in all of your ways. All of your ways acknowledge Him. And He will what? He'll direct your path. Not sure which way to go? Don't go! If you're not sure where to go, don't go! Ask the Lord what He would have you to do. Ask the Lord where He would have you to go. But something begins to happen when we take our eyes off of Jesus and we put it on man. Man promises us the moon, and man can't even deliver the moon. Man makes swelling promises only to disappoint us. And we are so disappointed when somebody says they'll do something, or they want something from us, or they want us to be involved in their life, and then something happens. Hello? And we get all crushed. And it happens in all kinds of areas of our life. Not only professionally, but spiritually, in relationships. I couldn't tell you how many times in ministry Someone walked through those doors and came to me and said, Pastor, this church is lovely. We love this church. Oh, we want to be here. Oh, this is God's place for us. Oh, we just love you and Sister Linder, and we love the ministry. Where are they? And time and time again, that's happened. And if you do not take Take your eyes off of man and put it on God. You'll never last. You'll never continue. And that's a fact, what I'm telling you. I can't begin to tell you the thousands of people that backslid when Jimmy Swaggett fell. Thousands of them backslid. Because they had their eyes on a man. Jimmy Swaggart felt my wife didn't backslide. I didn't backslide. But many did. Because they had their eyes on a man. A human being. For he shall be like the heath 
in the desert. Put that in the NLT for me, will you? Verse 6. The NLT, yes, thank you. They are like stun sh stunted shrubs in the desert. They are like stunted shrubs in the desert. Now, you know there are things that can be alive in the desert. But the people that put their trust in man, in the arm of flesh, they're like stunted shrubs in the desert. That tells me that they don't grow. One of the greatest faults of man is putting their trust in themselves. Trusting themselves. It was a saying, I am the captain of my ship. <laughs> well, your ship, your, your, your ship is sinking. <laughs> And you don't know it. You're not the captain of your ship. You never were. Because either the devil's your captain or God's your captain. You're either a child of God or you're a child of the devil. Now, too many people don't like that, but that's what it is. That's what the Bible says. You're either a child of God or you're a child of the enemy. Either one is your father. Let me ask you a question. Before you were a Christian, how many lied? How many of you lied? You lie a lot? The Bible says you're of your father the devil. For he's a liar from the beginning. You're only doing your father's business. You were lying just like your father. I'm not talking about your earthly father. I'm talking about your dark side father. Lie like a rug, they say. One lie after another lie after another lie. Until you get saved and you switch fathers. Hallelujah. Now you have a heavenly father. Now you're not supposed to be lying anymore. Otherwise you're still in putting your trust in the arm of the flesh. Speak the truth. Speak truth. Don't speak lies. Some people like half lies. What is the thing you always say, Bob? A half, a half truth is better than a full lie? But, you know, some people believe that. Some people actually believe that a, a, a half truth is better than a full lie. There are some people that believe that. And they'll lie to your face, and they think that you don't know. Curse be the man. You're like a stunted shrub in the desert. Look at this. With no hope for the future. No hope for the future. Let me ask you a question today. How do you affect change in your life? How do you affect change in your life? You can talk. Everybody's staring at me. How do you affect change in your life? Somebody hit Linda in the head. She's not getting it. Well, do something different, but how do you do that? It's, it's nice to know how to change a tire, but how do you do that? There's a procedure. There's a procedure to change. What? Absolutely. 
You change your operation base. But how do you do that? Well, it, that's true in one sense, but I'm trying to look for something else. Before you can change your, you got to change your, your information base. It came, right? That's what I want. I want you to think. You've got to change your information base. In other words, to effect change in your life, You've got to change your information base, where you get your information about you, about your life, about who you are, about what God has created you to be. Because let me tell you something, you have a, you have a, a counseling coach, and whatever that demon's name is, is sitting right, on your, right, up, right beside you, and he's the one that's telling you you're worthless, you're good for nothing, you can never amount to anything, you're always failing, you're always doing this. That's your information base. What you believe and where your life is today is a result of your information base. Well, I don't think. Well, I think I won't. I think I will. Your information base is what you are today. And if what you are today is still what you are in the future, you haven't changed your information base. Because in order to get to the operation base, you've got you to deal with the information base, and that will change your operation base, and you get a different result at the end. But you cannot go without having that operation base changed by the information base. Once you do, then you can change. But if you walk through these doors on a Sunday morning and sit down in this assembly and hear a message and you walk out indifferent to the message, let me tell you something, you have not changed your information base. If God's word is speaking to your heart, if God is speaking through his word to you, and he's speaking to you, and you are refusing that voice, then you have become indifferent to God. And by becoming indifferent to God, you'll never change your information base. You have to come to agreement with what God says. This is God's information base. If you look in the mirror and you say, I'm ugly, I'm skinny, I'm fat, I'm, I'm this, I'm that. And you begin to believe that. That will affect your emotions, that will affect your decisions, that will affect where you go and what you do. It will. You may say no, but it will. When you don't believe in yourself, you don't believe what God has called you to, and you don't believe who God says you are, then who are you believing? You're believing something. I can't. It won't happen to me. This ain't never going to change. You start thinking that kind of thinking, and what's going to happen is it's going to revolve into your emotional realm, and it's going to hit your emotional realm, which is going to hit your behavioral realm. And you're going to behave exactly like you think. For the Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. If you keep saying, I'm, I'm no good. If you keep saying, I can't preach. If you're saying, I can't do this, I can't do that. I can't witness, I can't do this. I can't! Then you won't! But when you do... And you say, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. You speak the word of God of what God says, and your information base changes your operation base, and you get a different result. So many people are stagnated.
So many people are, are, are shrubs in the desert. They don't grow. He says, with, it, with no hope for the future. There is no hope for change in the future. There's no hope to grow in the future if you are trusting in the arm of the flesh. If you're trusting in man. Because man can't meet your need. He shall be like a heath in the desert. You shall not see any hope for the future. They will live in the barren wilderness. Oh my God. They live, they reside. They're parked in that place called the barren wilderness. They are barren. There's no fruit. Nothing. Barren. In an uninhabited, salty land. Ever go anywhere and it's not inhabited? An uninhabited place is a very lonely place. There's no human interaction. It's a place of aloneness, despair. When I talk to people about Depression. One of the things they tell me is when they're depressed, they don't want to be around anybody. They want to be alone. <coughs> they say, I'm depressed. I don't know. I said, why are you depressed? I don't know. Well, if you don't know, how do you know you're depressed? Hello? You know why you're depressed. Well, Pastor, don't you understand? There's a thing called clinical depression. Yeah, I know about that. David said, why so downcast on my soul? Hello? He was talking about depression. He was downcast in his soul and his, his intellect and his thinking. That's depression. He said, why so downcast on my soul? Put your trust in God. There is nothing that you and I could go through in life that God cannot handle. There's nothing that you have in your life that God cannot deliver you from. There's no emotional instability that can grip your soul that God cannot deliver you and heal you from. If God could take a crazy man a man who ran around naked, a man who would cut himself and bleed himself all over the place and lived in the cemeteries and lived in the tombs of dead people. It was insane. Not in his right mind. And 
Jesus healed him. Cast out that devil of that oppressive spirit, that possessive spirit. We don't deal with demons anymore in the church because we've been accustomed to live with them. They've been accustomed to live with us. The Bible says when he cast that devil out of him, he said that man was sitting next to him, come on, clothed and in his right mind. Why not just turn him over to the doctors? They couldn't help. Why not turn him over to the psychologists? They couldn't help. Why not turn him over to the philosophers? They couldn't help. Why not turn him over to the Pharisees and the Sadducees? They couldn't help. What it takes is an encounter of Almighty God. When you encounter this God, come on, I'm not talking about some man-made statue out of clay. I'm talking about the real God. I'm talking about the living God. When you come in contact with Him, all things can happen. He'll shake the heavens and the earth for you. He'll remove mountains. He says they're in an uninhabited, salty land. One thing about salt is it makes you thirsty. The other night we had spaghetti sauce. And Linda said, that spaghetti sauce makes me thirsty. You ever have something that makes you thirsty? Well, let me tell you something. When you're in a desert and there's no water, that thirst cannot be quenched. They're living in an uninhabited place with, in a salty land. There's no one there that can help you quench your thirst because that's what man does. Man promises and abandons. There's only one who is faithful. There's only one, hallelujah, that's worthy to open the scroll books of the wrath of God in the book of Revelation. They looked into all the earth and all of the heavens and could not find one except for the Son of Man, hallelujah. And he was the one that was worthy to open up the scrolls. Can I tell you, he's the one that's worthy to open up the scrolls of your disappointment and heal you. Heal those who need the healing power of Jesus. So you've seen the curse, the binding. You saw the hemming in of the opposition that's released to a person that puts their trust in man. I mean, thank God for godly leaders. Thank God for those who fear God. And they try to steer things right. But I got a question for you. What's going to happen after eight years and Trump's gone? What's going to happen if the Democrats get a hold of the, of the Senate and the House? What's going to happen then? Don't put your trust in a man. As, as, as good as the appointments have been and the things that Trump has done, don't put your trust in a man. You got people wearing his sneakers that say Trump. You're getting people that wear shirts that say Trump. You got people that wear hats of Trump. When's the last time you wore a hat for Jesus? When's the last time you let your light shine before men that they would see your... Your, the good works that you have and glorify your Father in heaven. But we'll wear the stickers and we'll wear everything that has pertaining to man, but we won't let our Christianity shine. Come on. I'm telling you, there, there are people out there that are weird. I mean, they got Trump on their cars, they got Trump on their house, they got Trump all over the place. They eat, sleep, and drink Trump.
but get them to talk about Jesus. No, you know why? Because they're stunted shrubs. They can't give you nothing. They've got nothing to give. They live in a barren wilderness place in their life. Why do you think some people have to fulfill their life with everything all the time? Why do you think people have to be running all the time, running all the time, running all the time, running all the time, running all the time? Why do you think people do that? Because without that, they're nothing. Without that, they're the loneliest person in the world. But I got some good news now. Verse 7. Say the word but. B-U-T. The conjunction that makes the difference. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord. I'm going to tell you something right now. You can write this down in your Bible somewhere. There is coming a tragedy to this country. There is coming a real testing in this country. You know, there were ten virgins. Five were wise. Five were foolish. Five spent all that they had on their living. Used up all their oil. And then when it came time for the bridegroom to come, they had no oil. They came running over to those that had oil. Give us some of your oil. No. No. Ever read that? They said no. Well, that's stingy. That's not very Christian. No. You wasted your life. And I tell you, there are going to be those that waste their life and go to God and think God's going to just shake his little hand and go, okay, come on in. What have we made God to be? We've made God after our own image, after our own likeness. We've made God into a little pussycat. We've made God into our own little pet. And we think that God is obligated to do what we say. And we control God and we command God. And we tell him what to do. Come on. That's happening. There's a teaching out there that says from that scripture, command ye me. I forget where it is, but I know it's in the Bible. And I know they have that teaching out there. And they say that we're supposed to command God. See, because the punctuation there is not a period, it's a question. Command ye me? Not command ye me. Hello? Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and what? Confidence. What is confidence? What is confidence? Knowing what? Confidence in knowing what? Come on, somebody. You got to have the answer. Confidence in knowing that if God be for you, who can be against you? Putting God, confidence in the, in the promises of God. Putting confidence in what God says in his word. When you go through the most loneliest times of your life. Sometimes I think about that. 
Sometimes Linda tells me when she gets off the phone with some of the elderly she deals with, she feels like crying because they have nobody. They're all alone. They have nobody to talk to, and they want to talk to her, you know, because Linda's friendly some of the time. And most people like to talk to her some of the time. And she's, she can tell by their, by their heart and their, what they're saying that they're so lonely. The families just drop them off at these old age homes to sit around and die. You're blessed. You know how many daughter-in-laws don't want their mother-in-laws around? Come on. You're blessed. It's true. You have confidence in the things that God has said in his word, the promises of God. You have confidence, not in the ability of yourself, but in the ability that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could even ask or think. He's greater than what you and I can think. Hallelujah. And yet we limit him as if we could limit him. We can't limit him. He's unlimited. But it's our thinking that limits us into thinking that he is limited. He does great things. He's a great God. Far above what we could even ask, prayer, or think, imagination. Whew. Man, I, you, you mean God can, can, can do even greater things than what I've imagined? I heard the story of this scientist had a confrontation with God and he said, God, you know, science has figured out we can create man just like you did. We have the ability scientifically to create a man just like you did. So God said, okay, you can do that. He said, go ahead, do it. So the scientist got all his laboratory all set, and he went out in the yard, and he got some dirt, and God said, wait a minute, get your own dirt. <laughs> Hello? Get your own dirt. The Lord is your hope. The Bible says that we have a living hope. First Peter. He's our living hope. We have a hope. Hallelujah. People say, how do you know you're going to heaven? How do you know that? If I asked you that question, how do you know you're going to heaven? What would you say? Smarty pants. Over there. How would you know? Huh? Because the word of God says. What does it say? Huh? We believe. There's one scripture that sums it all up. It says, these things were written that you may know that you have eternal life. These things were written. These things were written that you may know not guess, not hope so, not think so, that you may know that you have eternal life. But you've got to know the God of the Scripture. You can quote that all day and not believe it. You can profess it all you want to. The 
May the Lord their hope and their confidence. Verse 8. Who's they? Who's they? Those that put their trust and hope in the Lord and he's their confidence. Those are the ones that he's talking about. Not everybody. Remember, the ones that trust in the arm of flesh and trust in the things of man are the ones that are stunted shrubs. They don't grow. But the ones that put their confidence and their hope in the Lord, they are like trees planted along a riverbed. Now, if you know anything about trees that are near water, when that tree begins to grow, those roots begin to sprout out, and they begin to go toward that water. They go deep to get that water, to get that, that water that they need, that nutrients that they need so that they can grow even stronger. God says that to you and I, that if we put our hope and confidence in him, in him alone, then we will be like trees planted alongside the riverbed. Hallelujah. And this is with roots that reach deep into the water. Come on, somebody. One thing about water is refreshing. One thing about water, it's necessary for life. Not for the stunted shrub, though. Such trees are not bothered by the heat. <laughs> you know, you have an enemy of your soul when he turns the heat up. I'm not talking about the natural temperature now. I'm talking about the trials and tribulations that every Christian goes through, persecutions, whatever it may be that you go through in life. And if you really think you really got it bad, come with me to India. Or I'll take you to the slums that I went to. If you really think you got it bad, come with me. I'll show you open drenches where their feces run wild. The smell is and the stench is so strong it gets in your nose. And it smells like that every single day of every single second, of every single minute, of every single hour. Think you've got a bat? <laughs> Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by the long months of drought. Many years ago, many years ago, I had a brother come to me that we went to school with, David Bolton. He said, God, give me a word for you. And I trust him. I said, okay, what's the word? He said, God's telling me you're like an oasis. He says, like you just stir up water for dry seasons. He says, you can go through some of the driest time, huh? like a camel. And you just store water up and you can go for, for long periods of time of going through dry spells. And he says, God's gifted you with that. And that's the truth. I've gone through some dry spells. I've gone through times where I don't want to do this anymore. But I know I know God long enough, hallelujah, that I don't let my feelings dictate to me 
or my situation dictate to me my decisions. I follow the will of God and I say, God, whatever you want for me, if this is what you have for me, then fine, I'll stay right where I'm at. Because I'm anchored in Jesus. I'm not going to run to the world. There's nothing in there. What am I going to run to? Why would I want to be without Christ in this world? The way that it's going, what we know. Why would I want to stay lukewarm when I know that Jesus said he'll spew me out of his mouth? I want to be on fire. I want to be hot for Jesus. Hallelujah. He said, such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by the long months of drought. Hallelujah. I'm reminded of the story, and I'm going to just close in a few minutes. Of the, of, I think it was Elijah. When there was no rain. He said, there's been no rain for three and a half years. Understand that if you have rain for one year, you're in a drought, and if you're in a drought, there's no food. Three and a half years of no rain. And he says, it's going to rain. Well, three and a half years, it hasn't rained. Now this man of God is saying it's going to rain. He tells his, his servant, he says, go run over there and look and see if you see anything. In the meantime, he's praying. And he goes back, he says, well, I see a little few clouds in the distance. Huh. He comes back and he says, go back again. And he does it several times. And finally, the rain is bursting so great, he has to outrun the rain. That the rain just kept pouring down, pouring down, pouring down, pouring down. Let me tell you something. Worrying is a sin. When you worry, you're not trusting God. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I don't know what I'm going to do. What am I going to do? Don't worry. We're in a society today where everybody's worried about this and worried about that and worried about their job and worried about this. Put your confidence and trust in the Lord. Not your job. They're not worried by the long months of drought. How many are going through a spiritual drought right now? Raise your hand. One honest person. Praise God. There's areas of our life that we're drought. Dryness. Deadness. One thing about my drought, I ain't worried about it. Because I know in whom I believe in and am persuaded that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I could ask or think. These are not just scriptures that come to my mind. These are part of my life. I can tell you right now that God has always provided for me. I was giving someone a testimony today. I said, I'm going to tell you something, brother. I said, God has never failed me yet. And he's always been there for me, and he's always supplied my need. I've never gone without a place, a roof over my head, or food in my mouth, or clothes on my back. And you have to understand, when I came to Jesus, I left everything. I left my profession. I left my home. I left my new car. I sold it to get out of debt so I didn't have to worry about those things so I could serve Jesus. I left it all. Their leaves stay green. Now, I don't know about the natural, because in the natural, I do not have green thumbs. I kill everything. 
I just don't have the knack that some people have like Nelson. You go to his house in, in the springtime and he's got all these, all these plants going and vines moving and all kinds of fig trees going and he's got tomatoes and an eggplant and all kinds of stuff going. He just has that ability to, to do that. Not everybody can do that, brother. No matter how hard you try, sometimes, man, you, you plant the stuff, you water it, you do everything, and it still don't come out right. But if you are planted by the river bank, your leaves stay green while you're in the wilderness. Come on, somebody. The long months of drought, your leaves are still green. You know why? Because you haven't separated the leaf from the vine. When you believe with all your heart that Jesus said, I'll never leave you, nor forsake you, you're connected to the vine. You're connected to the water source of your spirituality. Your spiritual condition does not deter is not determined by your physical presence anymore. Let me tell you something. When you're in India, like I was, and how they worship the Lord, this is, and I'm not making fun, Sajiv, I'm not making fun of you. I'm honest, I'm not. I'm just showing you the difference. Their tones are up, down, left, right. You know, here in America, we've got to all be right on tune. You know, we've got to have everything perfect. And their drums are all broken in pieces, and, and they're drumming away, and and praising and worshiping God with all their heart. And they are going through some of the most toughest battles in life. Understand, understand this. We had Hindus that were converted to Christianity. When they go home and tell their loved ones, their loved ones have a funeral for them and kick them out of the house. They have nothing to do with them anymore. Sajiv's dad used to beat him with a rod because he became a Christian. Your leaf will stay green in the midst of a long, dry spell or drought. And here's the key. They never stop producing fruit. Never! You never stop producing fruit. And I'm not talking about souls to be saved. I'm talking about fruit in your life. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, meekness, night, kindness, gentleness. The fruit is still producing. God still dealing. As I said Sunday morning, God still dealing with me with mercy. To show more mercy, more grace, more long suffering, more patience. Oh, don't pray for patience. That's a fable. If you're living a true life and you're living in this world, you're going to go through things that will give you patience. In fact, the Bible says, let patience have its perfect work in you. But you've got to let it. Not scream at it. Not yell back at it. Not react at it. Now throw your hands up. Why is this always happening to me? Why is it when I get in that line and I see it's a short line and I get in that line at BJ's, hallelujah, I get in that line because I was in this line, but that line's shorter and I go over there and all of a sudden all these people are passing me because this person has 60 coupons to scan. 
Oh, there's a problem and the light begins to flash. And the manager's busy with somebody else and it takes her five minutes to come over here. In the meantime, the spot that I was in would have been out the door already. Over, I stayed over there. Let me ask you a question. Is your leaf green? Is your leaf green? What happens when your routine is interrupted? What happened when your little routine is interrupted? You know your little routine you do? Do you get angry? Upset? See, in the morning, I can't get nowhere near the bathroom when Linda's in it. She has a routine, and if I just get one thing, if I just do one thing, it's like, And then I get these words, you're in my space. One thing about marriage, Bob, there's no my space. It's all hers. <laughs> Are you producing green leaves? long months of your drought. See, that's why the roots are deep. That's why the roots are down by the river. So that sustenance can come during that drought time and you can, you can feed off of that and still keep your fruit green, your leaves green. Keep your leaves green and, your, and yourself being fruitful. And you can show love. You can show compassion. And the fruits of the Spirit will come living through your life. Amen? I hope this helped you. I hope you got something out of tonight. Don't let your leave turn brown in the midst of your drought. Keep connected to the water source. The water source isn't for His glory, Christian assembly. The water source is Jesus. It's not the pastor. It's sad when some people won't come to church because the pastor's not serving the meal. Because if you're here for me, you're in the wrong business. You're in the wrong place. You'd be here for Jesus. Hello, you hear me? You'll be here for Jesus. And if you're here for Jesus, it doesn't matter who's standing behind this pulpit. If you have ears to hear what the Spirit of God will say through any person. Someone came to me one time and said, you know, I like Pastor Tom, but he's, he's too mellow. You know what I said? I said, what did you get out of the message? Let me tell you something. He's got some powerful messages. If you hear what the Spirit of God is saying, not what the man is saying. If you listen to what God is saying through the man. Hello? He can't be me and I can't be him. I don't want him to be like me. But he's got my heart. Oh, yes, he does. And he's sensitive. And he's anointed. I don't like the style of preaching. Too bad! I don't like Pastor Manny. He's too loud. If you were with George Cudi, you should be used to it by now. There ain't nobody as loud as him. And he could ring the hop off of, of piano.
Look beyond the vessel. Look beyond the person. Listen to the voice of Almighty God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight's Bible study. Lord, help us to draw from the water of the river bank. Lord, we don't want to be planted in the desert, in the wilderness, in the dryness where the stopping shrubs stumpy shrub, shrubs where there's no fruit, no growth. But we want to be by the rivers of water, planted. And during those times of drought, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lisa, stand up a minute. I got a word from God for you. God's speaking to my spirit and he's telling me to tell you that the latter rain is going to be greater than the former rain in your life. That even though in this drought, in this time of dryness, you can depend upon him. He's faithful. That in this time is not the time to be introspective, but to be Christ centered. He knows you don't feel like doing certain things during this time. But he's saying, press through. Press through. I'm, I'm, I'm holding your hand. Press through. I'm going to take you through this thing. Because I'm with you and I love you. You're in the palm of my hand. Don't think for one moment that I'm not sympathized with the way you feel or what you go through. I see you every single day. My thoughts are on you every single day. I know you're going in, you're lying down, you're rising up. I know everything there is to know about you. 